My name is Jennifer Madrill. I'm the founder and executive director of Designers for Learning. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization with a mission to give people opportunities to gain volunteer experience while at the same time helping underserved educational needs. This video is one in a series of interviews I conducted to gather additional perspectives as part of our Design in the Open Challenge, a professional development opportunity we're offering to explore ways to cultivate your professional presence in your chosen field. In this interview, I'm speaking with Tanya Doucet, Assistant Professor of Learning Sciences at University of Idaho. Our conversation is inspired by themes forwarded in the book, Show Your Work, 10 Ways to Share Your Creativity and Get Discovered by Austin Kleon. In this conversation, we contemplate two themes in the book, including theme three, share something small every day, and theme five, tell good stories. We join the conversation as Tanya provides us with her bio. So my name is Tanya Doucet, and I'm an assistant professor of learning sciences at the University of Idaho. I have been an assistant professor at the University of Wyoming. I've been a graduate student and teaching assistant at the University of Georgia. I've been an instructor for James Madison University and Blinn College. I've had an interesting, varied career, and I call myself the K-20 educator because I really am. I started off thinking about being a high school agricultural teacher. And then found myself and that went by the working way, with adult learners and then found myself working back with kindergarten and first and second grade learners and then doing middle school camps. So I really do span that K-20 spectrum and I've done everything from the certified licensed teacher in the state of Texas. You can still look me up in the database to working with continuing education. And that's where my passion remains is that K-20 educator piece. That's great. Well, thank you for that. I'm so glad to have you here. Um, Tanya and I run into each other periodically at academic conferences, but um, unfortunately for me, I've never had the opportunity to actually work with Tanya on any projects. I, I grabbed you, I think, at this year's AACT and said, hey, I've got something I'm, I'm cooking up, and if you could participate. And so she's been a very um, willing participant to, uh, to join us here <laughs> with not a lot of uh, head, heads up in terms of what we're doing, but um, those are sometimes the best. Exactly. That's what, hopefully these will be, this will be a good conversation where we can just uh, just chat about what's going on. Um, so really, just to frame our conversation today, as everyone who's enrolled in the class knows, um, we're inspired to have these conversations as well as the course based on a book um, called "Show Your Work" by Austin Kleon. And um, there's two principles or themes that of the book that I'd, um, I'd ask Tanya to help us kind of think about and, and consider in the next half hour. Um, the, it's the third principle of the book called Share Something Small Every Day, and the fifth is to tell good stories. And um, the reason I was so excited to have Tanya come on is I, I follow her on social media, and she is really great about having these little snippets about her day and um, and more importantly, what she's working on and kind of your impressions. And I, I love the authenticity of how you share things. It's not perfect and polished, but it's like, okay, this is, this is what's happening and it's raw. So if those are the types of things, hopefully we can kind of riff on as we're, as we're talking today. Um, so let's, let me just start out with a pretty broad and open-ended question to you. If you wouldn't mind just sharing with us your perspective on the importance of sharing as part of your process and this whole idea of showing, sharing openly and also consistently. Sharing is key, and this may actually muddy the waters a little bit and shift between the two principles, because sharing and storytelling really do go hand in hand. So I'm going to first share a story about what helped me realize why I needed to share and the power of storytelling. So to give you that, I'll separate myself from my actual career and talk about my dad for a minute. My dad is a retired chief petty officer for the United States Navy. He served in Vietnam, Grenada, and Lebanon. So I have a deep respect for veterans. My mom's also a disabled veteran from the US Navy. But my dad was this mystery for me as a kid. I didn't understand what he did in the Navy. I just knew that my dad was in the Navy. And I knew that when he was deployed, when he was on a ship, I knew that he was a radar operator. But he wasn't always on ships. Mm -hmm. He was often on base at Damnack in Virginia, and I didn't really know what daddy did. So at school, when it was career day, my dad's in the Navy, but when you live in a Naval community, that's just an acceptable answer. You don't understand what it means, what that job role is. And honestly, it took me until the third year of my doctorate degree 
to finally learn what my dad did. And it took me until my third year of my doctorate degree for my dad to understand what I did. Well, I, I actually sometimes like to hear what you, how you explain what you do, because it is a hard thing to explain what, what will you do, right? When you're an instructional designer, it can be such a funny conversation as we try to unravel all the different hats and jobs that we do. So this was sitting in a small little dive bar in East Texas over the Christmas holidays. And at this point, of course, my research as a doctoral student is beginning to solidify and I'm heading into data collection. And we're chatting and suddenly it hits both my dad and I that we, I do what he did. We do the same thing. Really? And I realized that my dad had been a naval instructional designer. No way. <laughs> but they didn't use that phrase. They didn't use that title. And of course, being the good little instructional design doctoral student, Bob Gagne, the master of all military training, I still show his P47 training videos to help students understand the value of audience analysis. And I'm sitting at this table at this bar with my father going, why? Why did it take us so long? So what was the problem? It was just, it was just the having the conversation of like, what did you like, did, how, what, what was the question? Like, what was He the, asked me what I was going to do for my research. Ah. And for my research, I was going to design three versions of the same online course for an EMS service. Okay. And I was going to look at different design principles and how it triggered and maintained their interest in this course. Okay. So as I was explaining that I had to design the course three different ways, to meet redundancy and modality principles and trying to have a good scientific communication practice where I'm not using these big theoretical frameworks. I'm using words that I can talk with dad. Right, right. Who has a high school diploma. And my dad said, yeah, I do that for kids all the time in the Navy. Wow. Wow. Boom. <laughs> and then you realized, yeah. There it is. But it took me turning what I do into telling a story to my dad to connect why I needed to be storytelling and why I needed to be sharing that storytelling. So how do you then incorporate that um, when you're thinking about kind of your, uh, if you think of it a couple different ways, one being your professional presence because your um, faculty working toward tenure and you're getting yourself out there in, in academic journals and at conference and thing, conferences and things. So how do you think about how the stuff you do, what I'm putting in air quotes, stuff that you do, mm -hmm. sharing on Facebook or sharing on Instagram or whatever it may be, and that, that process of sharing, storytelling, how do you consider that to be, do you consider that separate from what you're doing on your academic journey and on your professional work journey? Or do you think of those two things going hand in hand? I have to make them hand in hand. So this was a comment made at the AECT convention last week when we were in a mentoring workshop. And one of my former graduate school classmates, we're now colleagues together and we are looking at different studies that we can now conduct. She made a comment about how I have integrated my personal and professional lives on social media. Okay, okay. And I realized in that moment of reflection that it is something seamless for me because if I treat my life compartmentalized, I become dysfunctional because one informs the other. So as I began to think about this a little bit more, what does it mean to have a seamless presence to blend the personal with the professional? Because not everybody can do that. They're not comfortable doing that. I realized that it's also part of my teaching philosophy. When I think about social constructivism and constructionism and how we learn from one another and how we build and learn on our own, weaving back and forth. I like to know what's happening in my students' personal lives mm -hmm. because they bring that to the classroom and it influences what they do. I like to know what's happening in my colleagues' lives because they bring that to our collaboration. If we're conducting a research study, if we're trying to write a grant, $3 million to implement some new learning games, if I know what's happening in their personal lives, then I know when I might need to adjust my own actions to compensate or let go or take over more to be fluid and flexible, to help our team serve however I need. 
And I think you're bringing up a really um, important point that I hope we talk about in the, in the course as it, as it progresses. This this whole idea, you're also making yourself findable to others who may share a common interest. Yes. So speaking of storytelling, I'll throw one at you on the spot. Do you have a, an example of where someone said, hey, I, you know, I read your Facebook post or whatever. I didn't know you were working on this or you're interested in this. Or can you give us an example of where, where maybe that did come, come to pass, where you shared something that led to a collaboration? Absolutely. And I'll give you two little stories here because they're both different sides of my professional life. One was getting to the University of Wyoming as a new faculty member, and I'm trying to get on my feet. I've just graduated with my PhD. I have these expectations of a tenure track faculty member. I need to teach and conduct research and do service and get to know the people on my new campus and make new relationships. We talk about how it takes time to do that, and you have to hit the pavement. You need to walk into other buildings. You need to engage on university-wide committees to meet these people. Out of the blue, in my second year, I get an email from a faculty member in civil engineering who's asking me if I'm interested in a potential project he has. And I'm like, how did more. You, and how did you find me too, right? So he wants to develop, or he wanted to develop an app to gamify exploring engineering careers. Ah. I'm like, yes, you have my interest. Let's talk more. Yeah. So we set up a meeting and I go over to the engineering building and I meet with a, an architectural engineer and a civil engineer and we're talking about this NSF proposal. And I finally stopped the conversation and okay, I have to ask, how did you find me? Yeah. yeah. He said, well, you're one of the most active faculty members at UW on Twitter. Yeah. Oh, Twitter. Good. We're going to get on Twitter. That's good. He doesn't tweet himself or he didn't tweet himself that often. He does now. Right. But he was a lurker. And I've found that so many of my potential collaborators are lurkers, but that's how they found me. They found me through my storytelling on social media. Right. The other one came up just recently and it's actually triggering a professional change or shift for me. Two years ago now, almost a year and a half, I presented a session for EdTech team at the Wyoming Google Apps Summit for K-12 educators. And I was showing them how to use Google Drawings and Google Slides to create comics. Because I'm a huge proponent of creating comics in the classroom as a form of assessment. Check content knowledge through creation and design. I put this together this slide deck. I led this one hour session. We had so much fun. I tweeted out the slide deck. Well, it got picked up by another Google uh, innovator, Sylvia Duckworth, who's in Canada, and she loved the idea. So in the spirit of Creative Commons, because everything I, tried, I do, I try to license if it's mine, it's Creative Commons license. Remix, reuse, share. So she took it and expanded it, made a whole new slide deck, used a lot of my original content, asked me some probing questions on Twitter to get some more ideas, and then she remixed it into a new presentation. It continues to get shared on Twitter, on Google Plus communities, at local teacher professional development. In November, a month ago, I got an email from a special education teacher in Toronto who stumbled onto these slides and found my original deck and then had some questions about how she could help her elementary special ed students trace shapes in Google Drawings. So in the middle of my flight on the way to Jacksonville, I put together a really quick animated GIF of how to insert a picture into slide or into drawings and use the tools to trace out the boxes that you would make for your comic panel. Export it as a GIF, throw it into Google Drive and send her the link and she's like, oh my goodness, my students can totally use this. And this week I'm finishing up my Google Certified Trainer application. Oh my gosh. <laughs> It's something that I had not done. I've been, I'm a certified educator level one and two, and I'm a certified innovator through Google, and I get to work with the Google education team quite often. But I've never done the trainer piece, despite the fact that I train on Google tools. You're doing it, right. But you just haven't gotten that next step to, to get to the I hadn't team. done the test. Mm -hmm. I hadn't done the application or my video. I've now done everything but the video. So this week I finished producing that video to submit my application. Oh, wow. There's so many things. You just shared so many things that now. <laughs> go to. So to me, that's kind of like the qualitative side of, 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 of being on social network or networks. And I wasn't going to do this because it kind of makes me grossed out when we talk about the clout number. I don't know if people who are listening, it's K-L-O-U-T. 
Yes. It's kind of gross, uh, but it, it, it puts a number, it quantifies your influence uh, across multiple platforms on the internet. And Tanya is uh, 63. I looked it up just before we started. I'm, <laughs> I'm a lowly 52. So, um, but I think this is important to talk about because there is, even though I've been on Twitter 10 years, it still feels new. And it certainly feels new when you talk to people who've never been on it. Like, I, yeah. that's, there's weird stuff going on out there. It's political and people yell the at Russians each other. are taking over. The Russians are taking over. <laughs> But to your point, I could not be where I feel like I am. My professional presence would not be what it is. My lowly 53 or 52, whatever I am, would not be that had I not had Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and places like and YouTube even to put, put my work and share it. Um, so, like, talk about that a little bit. Like, um, the, the, the wild, wild west aspect of Twitter. Like, do you sense that or are you now comfortable enough you know where you can – ignore weird stuff that's happening and focus on the good stuff. Like kind of talk a little bit about that wild, wild west aspect of online. I wish I could say that we could predict reactions to what we have to say, but we cannot. So again, with the stories and when to share summer of 2016, a friend of mine texted me a picture from a event hosted at Texas A&M university. And it was the annual chalk talk where it's a charity event a number of women pay their, the fee to come to this event and they talk football with the various coaches at Texas A&M and all of the proceeds go towards a local charity. One of the coaches, and I, there's been some interesting discussion over which coach it was, rewrote the war hymn for A&M using misogynistic language. Okay. Mm hmm and I looked at this picture and I thought, oh my gosh, this was an official sanction event. What were they thinking? At the time, the communications director for athletics was a former coworker of mine. We worked together when I was at the engineering extension service. So I tweeted, retweeted this, or I didn't retweet, I tweeted this picture out because it had sent, been sent to me by text message. And I tagged Jason and I tagged the university and I was like, what is this? What are you thinking? Why would you sanction something like this at a public event? I was one of about a dozen or so voices I saw in opposition to this particular message. I also then got on a plane in Laramie and flew to Denver, then to LA where I went into blackout. Mm -hmm. Because I flew from LA to Auckland, New Zealand and did oh not my. have Wi Fi. Okay. Mind. Okay. I landed in New Zealand and my phone exploded. Then I got on a plane to Sydney, and if I thought my phone exploded in Auckland, it was worse in Sydney. Because originally it was just a few media individuals. I even had voicemails to my office line because those get forwarded to my email. And I thought, what has happened? By the time I got to Sydney and I finally had an extended layover, I could look at social media and find out what had just happened. All of the other posts on Twitter had been deleted. Ah, uh, okay. So you were the last the individuals person. Individuals had been attacked verbally by others. So they deleted their post. By nature of my circumstance, mine was the last one standing. Therefore, the spotlight was on me. Mm -hmm. What ensued over the next week, I could not have predicted. And I was also teaching a managing your digital footprint class. For so people were going to your Twitter account all week long? <laughs> okay, got so it. So while I was in a conference in Indonesia and holding my regular video conference with my students, I said, let's deconstruct what happened to me. What a teachable moment. <laughs> it really that's, was. That's great. So essentially what had happened, I was attacked by people I've never met. I was called an evil feminist. Mm. Um, more creatively, and I've kept this particular message just as a reminder, someone sent me a message request on Facebook calling me a rather unrepeatable phrase. Mm -hmm. Don't know this individual, have never met them, but they took the time to track me down and send me this message mm -hmm. and call me this derogatory phrase. Interestingly enough, and unexpected, people I didn't know also came to my defense. Okay. Mm hmm so as I'm coming through all of my notifications, there was at least one individual who consistently for two weeks after this event would respond to people who attacked me. And it was an interesting phenomenon to watch play out. 
perhaps it was fortunate that I was on the other side of the world, literally, and I was a day ahead of the United States. So I wasn't as directly engaged with the backlash and I wasn't available to talk to ESPN when they contacted me. Wow. Yeah. But it was very, I, I could not have predicted that that was going to happen. Eventually two assistant coaches were suspended. They had to uh, pay a fine, do community service. They were the ones who took responsibility for the situation. My former coworker contacted me back and was like, we did not see these. We did not approve these. We're looking into this. And I've since learned that a number of private complaints were lodged as well. It was just mine was the last public face standing who had complained about it. And so the media had latched onto it. So there I, are, like that. I was just going to say, there are so many uh, questions and let's try to see, see if I can remember them. Cause I do want to make sure I hit them all um, from what mm-hmm. you said. Like, first of all, clearly you didn't get off social media. I mean, it wasn't enough to, um, and one of the principles in the book, which I'm totally going to forget exactly what it is, but it's something like, um, it's basically learn to take punch, learn to take a punch. I think it's, mm-hmm. it's so I think you took a punch. So, <laughs> so why did you stick with it? Why did you say, okay, when that fold up your tent, which I'm sure a lot of people would have said, okay, this is just not worth it. Oh, I had to think of Leslie Jones. And I can only imagine the terrible things that she endured, the comments after Ghostbusters came out. And she did leave social media. So she immediately came to mind and I thought, wow, I'm getting a lot of hatred spewed at me, but I didn't get any threats. Mm-hmm. Nobody threatened to find me or track me down. Those were all thoughts that popped up because of what we see in here. I did reach out to both my husband and my parents to make sure that they were fine, that if anybody had contacted them, thankfully I had their support and they basically said, let them come to me and I'll support you. Mm -hmm. So that helped me not want to hide. But I think more than that, to be able to show others was a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. So over the last probably four years in particular, I've become more aware of the invisible mentoring that my presence Mm -hmm. has. And um, do you know Rob Moore, one of the doc students? Mm -hmm. So Rob Mm -hmm. is an up and comer in AECT in one of our organizations. And he and I have had more direct conversations lately. And through those conversations, I've realized just how much he's been watching Mm -hmm. and how he then processes what I'm doing to either model or decide, no, that's not something I'm comfortable doing. Mm -hmm. So over the last four years, as I work with more and more professionals who are entering the field or shifting fields, I've become more aware of, I may not know directly what impact I'm having, but I'm having one. So I have to make sure that I'm not just being selfish either. I need to protect myself. That's the number one rule. Mm -hmm. But if I'm not in any immediate danger, then my next concern are the people that I'm mentoring and working with, whether I realize I'm doing it or not. Sure. And I think um, even though, like I said, it's hard to put Twitter in a uh, timeline for me because it, it feels very long at times and it feels very short. And we've gone through different cycles. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, I, and I think you're hitting on something too. I think we're learning as a group, as a network, whatever it may be, those things that may be a, tw- a trigger. I, you know, mm-hmm. I'm sure when you sent that, you're like, this is, you had no idea this was going to trigger an avalanche that it did. But now I bet going forward, <laughs> if something similar comes along, you might, especially if you're going on a 24 hour travel. Yes, country. that definitely. And, and that I'm almost gets into the, why do I share what I share and what makes me decide? Yeah. I can't tell you how many times now I will have an entire post typed up, whether it's Facebook or Twitter. And then I just delete it. Yeah. And I'm, if I'm honest with myself, I may have read that in a Fast Company article. Mm-hmm. I do appreciate a number of their articles. Sometimes I look at them and think, yeah, there's no empirical evidence to support what you've just told me. Mm-hmm. But I believe that was in one of theirs where sometimes I need to type it out and look at it and then just delete it. Right. I had a chance to say it. doesn't matter that nobody else heard it. 
I was just going to say, we, we talked about, we um, spoke with Christy Tucker as one of the interviews and we were talking about this idea of audience. And so you think a lot of times, why am I on social media if I could set myself up for something like this? So there is that reflective piece of it. Oh, I love to be able to you know, put my thoughts together in 500 words if it's a blog post or whatever it may be, you know, 140 or 280 characters, I guess now on Twitter. There is that piece of like, okay, I, I got to form my thoughts. Then there's the piece to the audience. And so I think you bring up a great point. Like maybe that is a, a actually good row. <laughs> what that down is maybe a best practices where if you're thinking of this might not go over the way I've intended it, maybe this is one I just keep off to the side. <laughs> and oftentimes this will sound very silly, will also identify me as a child of the 80s with Disney. This particular movie came out well before then. I hear the little voice in the back of my head. If you can't say something nice, don't say something at all. <laughs> exactly. And it, those are great words to live by. My husband's boss used to have one too. If it feels good, don't say it, which I think I, I use that one a lot of times too. You know, sometimes you just really would love to say something and then you're like, if it feels too good, you probably shouldn't be saying it because you're doing it. Because the consequences of what <laughs> I say. For the wrong reasons. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, well, we've got a couple minutes left. I just wanted to, um, to kind of transition the last couple minutes of the conversation. We've talked a lot about kind of your perspective as, as how you feel as a, a person, a professional going out there. And you talked a little bit about the modeling, but how, how do you incorporate this in, in your teaching? And how do you, do you in, encourage your students to use social media? Do you have projects that they have to do on social media? Or how do you, you know, how do you frame, frame that? One of the changes I made at Wyoming that I hope continues, and I know that it has this semester because I interacted with one of their students, I required all of the education majors who take the pre-service teacher technology course to engage in two Twitter chats. And I don't tell them which chat, especially because so many Twitter chats come and go. Mm -hmm. Some are in the moment, some are scripted and scheduled, but they have to engage in two. And I try to do one together with them so that they can see what it's like. Or in some cases we might do a YO ed chat is the K-12 ed chat for, uh, for the state of Wyoming. And I might offer to do a tweet up and we'll go to Starbucks when, then they were Sunday nights. I think those chats are now Monday nights. And I would go be with them physically to help them feel comfortable engaging in this particular type of activity. But I want them not to see it as I'm on Twitter. I want them to see it as professional development that they're choosing to engage in and help them realize that. I have did the same thing here at Idaho, but rather than just focus on Twitter, I gave them a variety of mechanisms. And then for some of them, they realized that sharing on social media was beneficial for both them and their classmates and peers, whether those are individuals here in Moscow or elsewhere. So they could do a podcast or three, or they could do Twitter chats, or they could go to an ed camp or a summit. But when I think about how to purposefully integrate social media specifically, I want them to think about it being more of a seamless. So for me, Facebook is always a tab open in the background but that's because I have the self-discipline to ignore that little number mm -hmm. or you go find the tools that help you. So there's add-ons for Chrome that will hide the notification number from your tab so that you have to click on the tab to see it. Same thing for your email. It will hide that notification number in your email so that they're there. And that way it's not, Oh ding, I need to go look. I'm not going to be, Pavlov's dog and respond to that indicator. Instead, I'm going to work in my flow. And when I get to a stopping point in my flow, because I just can't figure out the phrasing here, or I just can't read this paper that I'm trying to grade anymore, then I flip over and I look at the other pieces and I look at my email or I look at my social media. By doing that in my flow, I'm not coming into 50 notifications. Mm -hmm or 30 unread emails that now take me the next three hours and take away from my original task. I'm coming into two messages, six notifications that I can glance at. And it's just somebody liked something. Okay. Who cares? I don't need to respond to that. Those two emails I can look at and go, okay, yeah, that's going to take more work than I have right now. I'm going to 
add it to a label, turn it into a task, stick it in my to-do folder to get it out of my inbox so it's no longer a distractor. And then I go look at Instagram and okay, I've got some likes, but I'm not really engaging back and forth on Instagram. I go look on Twitter and I may or may not need to respond to something real quick, but by keeping it in a cyclical flow for me, I don't have to silo out hours to work on these tasks. I can shift between them and keep them manageable bite-sized chunks, almost like sharing something small every day. Yeah. But I'm doing something small in each of these every day. Yeah. And then this is a perfect, perfect segue to our ending. I, I wanted to make sure I didn't forget to talk to you about, you just moved to your new campus this year. And so you've done the whole, and I'm doing the 360, 365 day photo um, for myself. I'm scanning old photos of my family, just using it as an opportunity to get them scanned and out on the internet. But you used your move as an opportunity. So I think you do pretty much do it every day, right? Where you find something uh, about your first, this is how I'm interpreting anyway, something about your uh, first impressions or new impressions of your new surroundings and mm -hmm. post about it. It's very quick on Instagram is where I usually follow it. Mm -hmm. Can you just spend a minute or two telling us Absolutely. about that and how that has kind of helped you feel acclimated to your new surroundings? I actually did this at Wyoming when I got there as a faculty member because I'm on this new campus and I'm not a student. So I don't have a reason to be in these different buildings for classes or to meet up with somebody. And now I'm a faculty member. And if I let myself, I could be an office hermit. And that's not going to help me. I'm not going to meet anybody on campus. And I'm not going to be able to tell my students how to get to that class that they've just registered for. So I did it to myself at Wyoming, which when I came here, I said, I have to do it again. Otherwise, I run the same risk. So I do it every day that I'm physically on campus. If I'm not on campus, I may or may not do it. So if I'm engaging with the schools for a project for some reason, uh, there was a day that we were at a local elementary school meeting with some teachers to launch a new study. So my daily pick that day was actually from the school. But if I'm at a coffee shop writing, I'm not going to take a picture. Or if I'm at a conference in Florida, I'm not going to take a picture and call it my daily pick. But it makes me get out and look at my surroundings. But then I also take it a step further. I go look up whatever it was I just took a picture of. So some of my pictures have been of building architecture on campus or one of our two of our water towers or the arboretum that we have that students call it the arb. I wouldn't know that because I only have seven students in my methods class this semester. So it's not like I'm in a lecture hall of 150 to learn the culture. So by taking this picture and then going to the university website or looking across Google, when was this building put up? Who designed it? Why was it designed? So I've learned that our administration building is the second administration building. The first one burned down. So you wouldn't have known that. Would not have known that. Yeah. Uh, I look at a building every day that is very cool. It's the Art and Architecture North Building. It was an expansion to the South Building. So it forces me to learn about my surroundings. But I'm also 2,000 miles away from where I got my doctorate, where part of my family is located. Mm -hmm. And I mean academic family. I'm 1,000 miles away from my family. And I'm 1,000 miles away from the friends I left in Wyoming. And I'm in a place that people see on a bag of potatoes at the grocery store. <laughs> right, when you go to make your mashed potatoes at Thanksgiving, right? That's when you see the... That's, the it's Idaho, that's all yeah. they know. So yeah. it's my chance to both learn about my surroundings and share that, but also teach everybody else that Idaho is not exactly what you think it is. I love and it. I love having that experience. And if I don't post my daily pictures... I will occasionally get a text message or a direct message saying, hey, where are you? I need my pictures. I need to learn. Right. And that's, that's the whole, I have a circle that I've been using in the course, like this learn, teach. It's just a simple circle. Learn on one side, uh, teach on the other, and it's a circle. And, uh, it is. And as you said, most of us won't have the opportunity in the near future, maybe ever, to go see your campus. And it's cool for that, and it's great for you to to learn as you're doing it. So perfect last example. Great. And it was a story and was about the share every day. It taught a nice little bow in the conversation. Well, thank you so much, Tanya. I really appreciate it. And you're very uh, welcome. I'm glad I could help. And the whole course sounds awesome. I'm excited. I can't wait till we get real life people, <laughs> real life people in Excellent. there trying to figure it all out at the same time. So thanks so much, Tanya. Have a great thanks. day. Thanks.
Bye-bye. Bye-bye.